Good evening, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see you all. Um, hello, Lisa. Uh, so Hi. happy to see you. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's Thursday, 6 p.m. and we are starting our uh, series of English Without Borders webinars. Um, Today we are hosting Lisa Mann. Lisa Mann is one of the most committed uh, members of English Without Borders. She has done a number of really interesting webinars with us. So, and many of you know uh, her really well. Uh, recently, Lisa um, has uh, delivered one month training, online training, and uh, Today, Lisa will be talking about uh, formative assessment techniques. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, Lisa, I'd like to um, give some brief information about her. Those who are joining uh, the first time and don't know Lisa, let me introduce her to you. So Lisa Mann has enjoyed a long career in the field of applied linguistics and over uh, the years she has worked as an English language instructor, program director, teacher trainer, and translator. In 2017, she worked with Peruvian Minister of Education to develop the national curriculum for English for adult basic education. In 2019, she served as an instructor and interim academic coordinator for Webster University's newly established MATSO program in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Two years later, she worked with the TSOL International Association to co develop and co deliver the blended TSOL course certificate program as part of Uzbekistan's English uh, speaking nations initiative, a large scale project designed to sharpen the skills of up to 15,000 secondary school English language teachers all over the country. She has worked as an English language specialist in Tajikistan on three occasions to provide professional development workshops to university and secondary school English language instructors. She currently lives and works in Spain. And I can also add to that, so, uh, Lisa has also been working extensively with English Without Borders. She has delivered so many interesting webinars with us, and we really hope that we'll keep the same dynamic working with Lisa in the future. Thank you, Lisa, and now the floor is yours. Thank you, Fulnoro, and thank you, my uh, devoted teachers who have come uh, to this webinar after spending the whole day with me. I'm sure uh, you must be getting tired of hearing my voice. Um, I'm so pleased to be doing this again for English Without Borders, one of my favorite English teaching associations in the whole wide world, um, and in one of my favorite places to be in Tajikistan. I'm joining you here today from India. I'm in Kolkata uh, doing a TESOL course. Uh, so if my internet gets patchy, please bear with me and I'll try to either come back or uh, uh, just sort of push through and, and fill in the blanks with our uh, chat. Um, so let's get started. So today my topic is uh, formative assessment uh, techniques. And uh, I'm sure many of you as experienced teachers have heard of most of these before and, and maybe even use them in your classes, um, but it doesn't hurt to revisit them and sort of remind yourself of their utility uh, once in a while. And, and sometimes we, we do so many trainings uh, and so many, we get so much information uh, that we forget little parts and, and little things that we can do in the classroom to improve our practice. So this, I hope, if it's not new to you, I hope that it reminds you of some of the things that maybe you have forgotten. Okay, so um, let's get started and just talk first. Start with a, a, a formative assessment technique called KWL. 
and KW, I'm just trying to look for so I can see my notes here, but I don't think I have you on full screen. I'll figure it out. So KWL stands for uh, Know, Want, and Learn. And this is a formative assessment technique that's very often used for things like this, for trainings, but also in the classroom. And, and it, it allows your students to sort of uh, activate some background knowledge first, uh, and then think about what they'd like to learn in your class, and then afterwards reflect on what they actually did learn in your class. Um, so before we begin this webinar, I'd like you to think just uh, for a second about what you already know about formative assessment. And while we do that, I'm going to try to get my screen right. Uh, I can't see. Okay, you can make a note if you'd like or not. Um, it's up to you. Uh, so what do you already know about formative assessment? Let's see if you want to type into the chat. Okay, someone says to put grades, Firu says, Gulnoro says unit tests. Anything else? What do you already know about formative assessment? You can keep it to yourself as well. You don't have to tell me. Praise, peruse, yes, okay, good. And the second, the W stands for want, and that is what do you want to know about formative assessment techniques? What do you expect to hear me say in this webinar? Natia says assesses students' weaknesses and strengths. Yeah, that's right, good. So you maybe think, maybe chat down on a piece of paper if you want, what you would like to know. And then later, after I'm finished with this webinar, we'll finish the uh, KWL chart with the L section, which is what did I learn uh, about from for formative assessment. All right, so let's get started. Um, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue and that I, my screen is not uh, as, as uh, oops, as big as I would like it to be, but that's okay. Doesn't affect you, I guess. So that's all right. Let's see, maybe it's one of these ones. No, okay. No problem. All right, so let's take a look at the contents for today. We're gonna look at the difference between summative and formative assessment, two types of assessment that we all use as teachers um, and that we all uh, need to, uh, need more tools for, yeah, and more tools and techniques. Uh, then secondly, we'll look at some of the tools and techniques we can use to formatively assess our students, yeah. So let's take a look first. Now, probably you already know what the difference between formative and assessment, formative and summative assessment uh, is. Uh, Fernando's written a nice explanation here. Uh, and we, as I say, we do both of these in our classes uh, fairly regularly, usually, yeah. Uh, the goal of summative assessment is to evaluate student learning at the end of an instruction, instructional unit. So it's usually associated with a score or a grade, yeah. This is um, how we, this is our unit test, for example, in, in university, sometimes it's just one big exam at the end of the course uh, that uh, tells the teacher uh, supposedly whether you've learned or not, uh, whether you've learned the content or not, and it's connected to some kind of formal evaluation score or grade. Formative assessment, on the other hand, is used to monitor student learning. So look at the difference in these verbs. Here we have summative assessment is used to evaluate student learning after the fact, uh, while formative assessments used to monitor student learning during the process to provide ongoing feedback to learners and to adjust your lessons to student needs. But that's not all formative assessment does. It also helps our learners know what they still need to work on, which is very valuable to them for a lot of reasons, which we'll talk about in just a minute. 
All right. So maybe, so if summative assessment is meant for evaluating student learning by measuring it at the end of uh, a unit or at the end of your teaching cycle, what are some different tools that we use for summative assessment? I just mentioned an end of course exam. Uh, what other tools do we use for summative assessment? Anyone? Gulnoro asked, what tools are used to measure both? Well, Gulnoro, the, um, the, some of the tools and techniques I show you today, you could match a grade to those, uh, but uh, they're, they're generally used for your own uh, uh, evaluation, your own monitoring to adapt your teaching to your students' needs. Okay, so here are some summative assessment uh, tools, progress tests, diagnostic tests, essays, tests, anything else? What else do you give a grade on? Do you give your students a mark or a score for? Can a project be summative? Can you give your students a, a score or a mark for a project? For a presentation, for sure, Natia. Presentations, yes. projects, posters. You can uh, evaluate basically any student work, right? As long as you establish criteria for evaluation. You can evaluate group discussion, good. You can give them questions. There are lots of different ways you can evaluate student work, both, both using summative and formative uh, assessment techniques. Uh, role play, Biswajit says, which is absolutely right. So some of the summative assessment tools, uh, the most commonly used ones uh, are things like quizzes, yeah. Uh, when I was in university, we had quizzes all the time, sort of pop quiz to check and see if we had done our reading. Uh, and those were graded. Uh, exams, um, your students have to pass sometimes an exam in order to move to the next level. Uh, essays or other writing assignments. And final projects, um, which is um, becoming more and more uh, common and more and more popular as a way to uh, assess students after the teaching process to see what they can show you, how they can demonstrate their, their learning, but also to give them a grade. Yeah, it, our job, one of our jobs as teachers is to assign a mark to our students, and that's something that we have to take seriously. And presentations, as many of you said. Okay, so these are summative assessment and, and one way to think of it is sort of formal and informal or for a grade and not for a grade. Formative assessment just tend, is not for a grade. It's, it's usually only for uh, you and your students to know whether they uh, have understood your material and can use it and uh, whether you as a teacher can move on and start something new. Okay, so formative assessment, as we said, it has a couple of different purposes. One is to monitor student learning, so you can adapt your lessons to address any problem areas. Um, but it also helps your students see their own strengths and weaknesses. So it encourages this sort of metacognition that is thinking about learning uh, and, and allows our students to see uh, what they're good at and what they need work at and set their own goals. So uh, by sort of showing very clearly without any, uh, without any grade or mark attached to it, but showing our students what they still need to work at, it allows them a little bit of autonomy. It, it encourages uh, learner autonomy in them because they can set their goals and work to, uh, to achieve them and to improve. Um, uh, but it, for me, most importantly, as a teacher, allows me to see what I need to reteach or what I need to revisit or what I need to recycle relatively soon. Um, yes, good for thinking about thinking 
it's thinking metacognition is thinking about thinking or thinking about your own learning yeah and it's an important skill to have it's reflective as fernando says so type into the chat how often do you as a teacher stop and check to see if your students learning is on track so you can decide whether to move on or perhaps to spend more time on a certain topic. Uh, sometimes you, we do that almost every day. Sometimes we do it when we get to a certain point in the unit. Sometimes you do it after you do some kind of grammar ex exercise or some kind of vocabulary learning. Fernando says he does it constantly. Peru says after each four units of of your book. That's quite a lot of uh, learning um, before you start checking uh, for Ruse. I would probably do it a little bit more frequently than that. Um, it could be, for example, every time uh, you introduce some kind something that you you feel is important uh, and they've practiced with it quite a bit, but you still aren't sure if they've got it or not. And then you might want to just jump in with a quick formative assessment. And the beauty of formative assessment is that they tend to be quite quick. Let's take a look at some different types. So uh, formative assessment techniques uh, include quick checks, and we're going to look at all of these. So if you don't know what they are, um, don't worry. I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Okay. Checklists, uh, self-directed responses, uh, uh, and uh, a sort of technique slash uh, uh, game called Four Corners. Exit tickets, good, Natia said that, good intro and outro tickets, checklist, and journals. So we're gonna take a look at all these different things. I hope we have time to do it, uh, but some of these are very fast ways to just look around your room and see, okay, most of my students have understood this. We can move on to the next thing or oof, we need to spend more time um, to, uh, to, uh, on this so that they get feel stronger and they, they can do it. And I'm sure they can do it before we move on. Okay, so let's take a look at quick checks and we'll try to do some of these. Um, Natya says ch quick checks are something like thumbs up and thumbs down and that's right. Quick check can be thumbs up and thumbs down. I don't know if you have your, your camera on me, but your thumb up could be true and your thumb down false or yes and no. Or you can do it with fingers, with one, two, three, and four fingers. So let me see. I, I don't know if I can see you all here. I've just turned your, if you want to turn Turn your cameras on. I don't know if my internet will, <laughs> if my internet will stand it, but let's see if you can answer this question using your fingers, using a finger check, so I can uh, see if you've understood so far. It says the main purpose of formative assessment is one to teach students to write essays, two to keep a journal or portfolio, three to evaluate student learning at, to assign a grade or four, to monitor student learning to adapt lessons to meet student needs. So you can, uh, you can hold up your fingers or you can type a number in the chat. Nadia has a four fingers, Virus has four fingers, Sandeep, I see you but I don't see your fingers. Uh, Biswajit says four, good. Okay, so this is called a finger check or a quick check. It allows you to look out uh, uh, among your students and see sort of who's got it and who doesn't quite get it yet. Uh, nobody speaks during this uh, because if one person speaks then suddenly everybody knows, but it, uh, everybody just sort of silently raises their fingers depending on which, um, which uh, uh, option they think is the best answer. Yeah. Thank you, Manisha and Sanjeev. Good, number four. Ah, oh, Manisha, you said number three. No, formative is number four and summative is number three. All right, so let's take another look at a different quick check. Uh, these are uh, whiteboards. And we don't have these here, obviously, because we're online. 
Um, <laughs> but with a whiteboard, these are just document holders that have a blank sheet of paper in them. And your students can use a whiteboard marker on them and they're easily erasable. Um, it's just a way to not waste paper. But if you don't have them, you can just have a sheet of paper or a sheet of cardboard that says true on one side and false on the other. So let me see, Type. do you just have to type it into the chat? Because we don't have this way of holding up papers here. Uh, but if we were in a classroom, your students could. Again, not saying anything, just showing you their answer. True or false? Standardized, standardized exams are a form of formative assessment. True or false, T or F? Bruce says true, do you agree everybody? Gulnoro says false. I don't know how to pronounce your name because I can't read Cyrillic, but you say true, true. Fernando says false. Mary says false. Okay, so now I see, because you have this, I'm looking out and I have this mix of true and false, that I need to probably repeat this um, again, uh, because some of you didn't seem to get this right. So a standardized exam is something like the Cambridge First Certificate, or the TOEFL, or uh, the IELTS. And these exams or exams created by your school district, these exams are summative because they are for a score. They're also tend to be high stakes and a high stake exam means, high stakes exam means it's very important that it can change your, can change your life in some way. Um, so standardized exams are not so that you can monitor your students' learning. They are for a, grade and they they evaluate your students for a, a, the purpose of passing them or failing them, moving them on to another level, changing uh, their class, et cetera, and allowing them to enter university, um, all kinds of things. You could use, I imagine, a standardized exam as a term, a, a type of formative assessment, but it would be strange. Uh, standardized exams are very formal, yeah. Yes, Gulia, thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, this one you can use in your chat box, uh, the emojis. And again, these are just with whiteboards or just uh, a piece of paper where they draw an emoji on it. If you're in a, an online class, you can use the uh, emojis that you have um here in your in the chat so how do you feel about the weather this week uh you know if you're do, doing a lesson on the weather um and here in in india this week the weather has been extremely hot uh so we feel a little bit crazy <laughs> okay mary says no nah. she's like no it's not good or bad yeah uh, for Bruce is, <laughs> is very happy about the weather. Uh, I know my uh, my teachers I'm working with here in Kolkata, uh, we've been having a very, very hot um, period. Uh, Mijanur, yes, end of year's exam are formal and therefore they're summative. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's really the assignment of a grade and the importance of uh, passing or failing or how well you do, how, how well you score on the grade that make, on, the, on the tool that makes it either summative or formative. Okay, so whiteboards, thumbs up, thumbs down, one, two, three, four. Uh, these are ways that you can easily look out and check and see who, ha who gets it and who still needs a little bit of work. Okay, good. <laughs> some people are not enjoying the sun this week, but some of us uh, are. Okay, now what about checklists? A checklist is a type of rubric, really. Uh, and sometimes they can be super simple, just like this. Now, for example, imagine that uh, I have, these are my students, and this is the date, the 4th of April. And uh, on this date, they're doing some kind of role play 
uh, or they're doing some kind of conversation where they have to um, speak about their daily routine and ask each other questions about the daily routine or something like that. Now, I could just be listening. We often use checklists for speaking activities in the classroom for formative assessment. And I'm just walking around as they're doing their interview or their conversation and marking check. She can do it. Tahmina can do it. Raquel can do it. Zebo can do it. Ah, Parvina, not quite. She's not getting that S. And I make a little note yeah, to myself. Uh, this is kind of a combination checklist and what's called an anecdotal record. Um, an anecdotal record is, uh, I'll write it in the chat. Is a, it's just a note to yourself so that you can remember what, uh, what your students uh, need, what they, what they still are kind of shaky in and what you can, uh, what you can expect uh, to have problems with uh, later on. So this is a checklist. They got it. They don't have it. Yes or no. They, can they do it? Can they not do it? Yeah. And it, you can use the same checklist again and again for all kinds of different tasks for speaking, reading, writing, listening, um, but quite often, as I say, used for speaking. So you just going around listening and seeing if they can do it. Now, this is a much more formal uh, and much more detailed type of uh, speaking checklist uh, that you might find uh, in a university class, for example, uh, when you're trying to, uh, when you're teaching speaking and listening to and focusing on those two skills for, um, for a specific purpose. And then you would have bro this broken down in a very um, rubric-like manner, but again, not assigning a score, just yes or no, yeah? Can they do it or can they not do it, yeah? Uh, and this allows you, as especially at a university context, as you move along through the term uh, to sort of pinpoint the students who might need extra help and tell them, Hey, listen, uh, Simon Bolivar, <laughs> why don't you come and see me in my office? Uh, because we're having some problems with, uh, I see that you're not sort of getting the, using the appropriate expressions and the functions. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about that. Again, not for a grade, just so that you know, and they know how they're doing over the course of the uh, class. Um, Okay, so the next tool or technique I want to show you is called a self-directed response, and this allows for learner autonomy in many ways, and most importantly, because it allows for choice, and it gives your students a choice about how they want to demonstrate their knowledge to you. So a self-directed response is a, a, a way to demonstrate understanding by summarizing the topic, and they can do it in many, many different ways. This can be something that you assign, but most often with a self-directed response, the, the word self is, is quite important in there, the student chooses how they uh, how they demonstrate their understanding. And this can be something they do as a homework assignment uh, over the course of uh, a week, for example, to show you how they have understood the content of your last unit. And this is an extremely powerful formative assessment tool because your, student, uh, your students themselves are thinking about their own learning uh, and they can um, they, they're sort of, which raises their sort of metacognition skills, their ability to think about thinking, uh, but it also allows them to set their own goals and, and it allows them to think about what do I need to do in order to, um, in, in order to improve, which is a, a powerful uh, thing to be aware of. Yeah. Okay, one more. This is called Four Corners. So do you know this Four Corners? Um, uh, technique or, or game? Have you played this before? Can anyone type in the chat? How do you think it works? How does four corners work? If you know, if you, if you know, 
We can't do it here, obviously, because we're online and we don't have any corners. <laughs> but if we did, I would put in each corner uh, some kind of sign uh, some, and hang it in, in each corner of the room. And the sign can be A, B, C, D. It can be different colors. It can be agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. And you ask a question to the class and the students move individually or in pairs to the corner of the room that corresponds to their answer. Um, individually is fine, but sometimes uh, an individual won't feel uh, confident enough to make a decision like that. Uh, so putting them with a partner allows them to discuss their answer for a moment before they move to the corner that they uh, that they choose. You can use these for lots of different things, but it's also it's uh, it's engaging, it's fun, it's it's active. It makes your students get up and move around, but it also lets you know who understands and who needs a little more work. And if most people misunderstand something, that maybe you need to reteach it. Uh, yes, Biswajit, we played it today. We sure did with. What did I have in the corners today? I had, well, it wasn't corners because we were in such a giant room, but we had sometimes, always, often, and never. And we talked about different uh, teaching, um, teaching practices and how often we do them. All right. So it's a great starting point for, uh, for formative assessment, but it's also a great starting point for a conversation. So what would you uh, do after this? What would you do with the results of this? Imagine you have A, B, C, and D, and everyone gets the answer right. Everyone moves into the correct uh, corner. And so you're, you have four answers. What would you do then? What do you think? Everyone gets the answer right. You say, um, you're doing a reading comprehension and you say, uh, what did the boy say to his sister? And then four possible answers and the, the kids have to move around. Well, if everyone gets it right, if everyone gets it right, if everyone has the correct answer, you simply praise them. Well done, that's right. But if half of them get the, it right and half of it don't, you can ask the ones who did get it right to help the others explain to them why you think it's right and why you uh, why you chose what you did. Yeah. So you give them some feedback, but you also give the students who uh, have understood the chance to help those who haven't. Um, uh, but you're also taking note who hasn't understood so that you can uh, help them a little bit more later. Now, if most people are in the wrong corner. Mm, maybe it's it's uh, appropriate to reteach or to revisit uh, what you've just what you've just taught. All right. So another uh, formative assessment technique that is very, very often used are exit tickets, or it, sometimes they're intro and outro tickets. Although all those tickets going on for me is a little bit um, much, uh, and Exit tickets are useful, I think, sometimes, but I, I've never fallen into the habit of um, using them all the time. So I pick and choose when I use an exit ticket. And exit tickets are basically these types of things. They are something that your students write down as they're leaving the classroom. Um, so, and there are lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, this one, for example, uh, this girl said she had to choose one word that she learned today. Uh, and she says, why I choose agreement? Because we learned how to check our papers for subject and verb agreement. I was finding errors in the songs, right? So uh, she wrote down what she, the word that she learned that day and what she thought was uh, interesting to her. Here, the five things I do every day, this is a way uh, your, the teacher collects these and she can automatically see, okay, these guys understood those verbs. They understood wake up, they understood hug, 
they understood brush and they understood clay. And you have this evidence, this data that tells you um, that they've got it, right? I don't know why that's in there twice, but there you are. So those are some exit tickets, but I'll show you a few different kinds. Um, sometimes they ask for a general reflection about the lesson and they look like this. So today we learned about blah, blah, blah. For example, blah, blah, blah. I can use this when. So for example, today we learned about the daily routine. For example, uh, I get up at six o'clock. I can use this uh, when I'm talking to my friends and telling them about my life, yeah? So these are uh, a general reflection about the lesson in general. And again, this kind of metacognition, which is a powerful tool to have. There's a different one uh, with a general reflection. The most important thing I learned today is, for example, blah, blah, blah. The most difficult part for me to understand is that, that, that. If one or two or three students have this difficult part, maybe the next day you want to revisit that and reteach that, yeah? Uh, or, or maybe if only one kid says it, maybe you just wanna help him or her, yeah? Exit tickets can also require students to complete a specific task, like those ones I showed you at the beginning where they had to choose the word that was most interesting to them, or they had to write five things they did um, that uh, they, they typically do. So here again, write three expressions I can say related to the weather. Uh, they have to write these out, everyone hands them in and you see if there are any problems, yeah? Uh, so for example, it's super hot today in Kolkata, or it, it's sweltering or um, it's extremely hot. <laughs> I don't know if I can stress enough how hot it is today in India. It is burning up. Um, or for example, three things I plan to do next week. Again, we're checking, can they use that future that we've been talking about today in our lesson? Those are some exit tickets. Uh, another uh, formative assessment technique uh, are journals, but journals can be tricky, uh, can be kind of tricky. So I wanna have a little conversation in the uh, chat box about using journals um, because they are tricky. They're wonderful in many, many ways, but they're, they can be kind of hard. So let's talk about first some advantages and disadvantages of asking your students to keep a journal. And a journal is again, just them writing about their learning ex experience and their learning process or about their lives in general uh, in a, a sort of um, continuous way. So they have, maybe they don't write every day, but, but they write every couple of days or every uh, after every class. So what could be an advantage and disadvantage about asking your students to keep a journal? What do you think? I think for me, one disadvantage is some kids don't want to keep a journal. Right? Sometimes it's not, it's hard, it's a hard sell. They don't, they aren't so interested in keeping a journal uh, about their learning. Yeah. Okay, maybe they're true about themselves. Um, but the journal, again, if they're only doing it for themselves, um, uh, they might be true, but if they know that you're going to read it, they might feel a little that, and this is a disadvantage, they might feel a little um, uh, nervous, or as Sandeep said, they might lie <laughs> because they know the teacher's going to check it. Uh, Natia says they monitor their own learning and progress, and that is an, a huge advantage of a journal. Um, it also improves their writing. They, their writing skills, just the fact that they're writing in English um, is, a, uh, is advantageous, right? <clears throat> uh, students can estimate what they've learned. They can use what they've learned in class in their own writing and use to express their own ideas and to describe their own experiences and lives, which is 
again, it's powerful, right? It's something that they can do. They can reflect. Okay, so at Gulnoral, I don't, I, I wouldn't suggest that they share it with the class. A journal is something that usually is private, it's just for you. But uh, in a, a sort of learning journal, the student would have an agreement with the teacher that he or she will show it to the teacher at some point. So there is that understanding from the beginning. You can have journals that are private that your students never show anyone, and that's fine, but you won't know um, what their progress is if you don't get to look at it. So it depends on what, you, what your objective is, but I've had my students look at, I've had them show me their journals, their, their writing journals for, for me, just not for a grade, just so that I can see what they're writing and that they are writing. It can be personal for Nando, that's perfectly fine, but that, then that's just for them to do and whether they do it or not is completely up to them, right? Yeah, only if they want to, right? If they want to keep a journal and not show you, that's fine, but if they want to show it to you, it can be a valuable tool to you uh, to see what they have, what they can do and what they're, what they're thinking about their own learning. Uh, yes, yeah, somebody's hand is up. Can I have a question? Can't see your name very well. No? Okay. <clears throat> How can you find time to review? Okay, Fernando, do you have a question? What they've written in their journal. Imagine yes, you have. Uh, I, I believe that, yeah, one thing that you can do, which is really nice, is like related to journals or diaries is the teacher can guide the students with some questions. Like you post a question on the board, like what was difficult today? Or mm -hmm. what, what did you like about the class? Or uh, how could you use this in a certain situation, et cetera? And then yeah. students, as you said, not all students will write the journal. I agree with you hundred percent, but some students will. And then at, after one week, you can have like an open class where nobody has a journal, it's just like a big round circle. And you bring up these questions and get ideas from the students. That way, yeah, that's those nice. who, that way, those who don't write the journal are still in a reflective process. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. That's a good idea. Uh, you can also have sort of standing questions that they should think about it every time they write in their journal like uh, yeah. if, if it's a learning a learning log right yeah what yeah, exactly. uh, and questions like the ones you mentioned yeah what did you learn this week and why is it important to you and how can you use it in your real life yeah, yeah you, you can also ask them questions about the teacher like what did you like about the teacher what didn't you like about the teacher what would you tell the teacher yeah. you know how would you tell the teacher uh what suggestions would you give to the, about certain activities and that's, that's the reason why I believe that the journals can only be read by the teacher if the student wants to. Because if he doesn't, if he puts things that are, you know, that way he's true to himself, you know? Mm. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't think that a journal should be shared with a teacher unless the student really wants to. Yeah, okay. Well, if they want to, um, they that's up to you. It's a it's a it's an agreement to be made with uh, with your students, whether you see it or not. Uh, and it's also uh, based on your objective for the journal. Is it for them or is it for you to uh, to improve your teaching uh, and to reflect on your own teaching as well as their learning? Uh, it depends on your objective and uh, what you agree with with your students, of course. Um, all right. Uh, the problem, one problem, a major disadvantage to journal is journals is that is that if everyone does write in a journal every once in a while um, or every week, every couple of days, then you have a huge amount of uh, content, a huge amount to look over. Um, and how can you find time to review what they've written in their journal? And this is a tricky one, but in the past uh, I have. Uh, simply gone through a cycle of, of collecting journals uh, every once in a while while everyone is working on something else uh, and take them to my desk and give them some feedback and notes about what uh, they've written. All right, so let's see. Am I early to finish? 
I guess I am a little bit early, but we can have a conversation. So to sum up, um, formative uh, assessment lets the teacher know when his or her students are ready to move on or when further instruction is needed. And this is something that um, uh, every reflective teacher needs to, uh, to think about, right? Do I need to reteach this or are we ready to move on? Uh, and many novice teachers, beginning teachers just tend to push on. Uh, we've already done that. We're not gonna do anything more about it. Well, uh, a, a, a reflective teacher and a good teacher who's dedicated to teaching and learning um, will reflect, will gather data from his or her students to find out if it's okay to move on yet or if they, further instruction or explanation is needed so that they really get it. Um, formative assessment also helps students to understand what they still need to work on. Um, and this is important, uh, just as important as you knowing what they still need to work on, uh, because it helps them to create, it helps them, to, it helps to promote learner autonomy and, <clears throat> and allows them to set goals for themselves. Uh, some formative assessment techniques contribute to creating an active classroom in which nobody sits passively. Yeah, so if you're uh, uh, calling on students one by one, uh, what are the rest of your students doing while you're calling on one person? Well, they're probably just sitting there. Yeah? And once one person answers, nobody else will have the chance to answer. Why, why would you do that? That's they would just repeat what you, the, the last person said. So using things like finger checks and whiteboards, uh, those allow everybody in the room to answer at the same time. Um, and nobody is sitting there passively while you call on student after student after student. <clears throat> Other formative assessment techniques encourage metacognition or thinking about learning, which raises self-awareness and increases motivation and learner autonomy. It allows students to set their own goals yeah, and to make choices. Uh, if you can allow them to make choices about how they demonstrate their knowledge and how they demonstrate their understanding, um, it's extremely motivating to have that choice. Um, and you saw that with the um, the choice of drawing a picture or making a graphic organizer or writing a summary, given this, them all of these choices of ways to demonstrate learning that both take into account uh, learner differences and give them choices, which promotes autonomy. All right, so at the beginning, we thought about what we knew about formative assessment. You thought about what you want to know about formative assessment. And is there anything that you have learned about formative assessment? I know most of you are experienced teachers who, who probably knew most, most of this already, but maybe you learned something new. Uh, if you'd like to, you can type that into the chat or you can tell us um, what you think. And I'll see if I can um, look through. I haven't been able to read your notes since you've been since you've been um, going, but I will look now and see if there's something that I thought was good that I want to include. I learned from you. Hmm. Good. A journal is, it doesn't have to be a diary. Uh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be super personal. You can tell your students what you want them to write in it. It can be a learning log, um, which is maybe a better way to, um, to, to name it. A learning log is, um, <laughs> a learning log is, is about, it means that you're writing about your learning and not about your life. You don't have to write about your boyfriend or somebody that you like or how you feel about your mother and father. Uh, it doesn't have to be that personal. And if it's a learning log, then, um, and, and then your students will be more apt to share it with you. Okay, do you have any questions before we finish this uh, webinar, this regular Thursday webinar? 
how can you minimize cheating in online assessment? Uh, I'm not sure that what the answer to that is. Uh, uh, Fernando, what kinds of online assessment are you talking about? Like some kind of test? Like, uh, like a multiple choice test, is that what you mean? Um, I think uh, sometimes students can be giving home or uh, taking an uh, exam. So they can do it online from their home. Uh, but I don't know uh, what kind of assessment. So you, how, how you can um, detect if they are cheating or not and how you can assess it. I think this is what he meant, but. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I've only been teaching online for a few years and I've not had to do um, online assessments. And when I do assessments for my, my university students, there's, it's not a multiple choice or something. They, they have to write something. So it's not, um, uh, they can use the internet. But if you have a multiple choice questions, I'm, I'm not sure about the answer to that, I'm afraid. Um, maybe just by using a different type of assessment, like something that requires uh, a creative answer that that uh, can't be plagiarized with some kind of thinking question, open-ended thinking questions, rather than something that is just a fact or that the kid might find or copy from the internet. Ah, good. Anatia, you ask a good question. She says, I'd love to know uh, some effective ways for using and analyzing the information uh, collected by some of these uh, techniques. Uh, one way, when I was teaching a writing course, I teach a lot of writing courses. Uh, one writing course that I taught that had several assignments throughout the uh, term, uh, I focused on uh, three or four errors that uh, each student had, and I had an Excel sheet. So I, the idea was rather than um, asking them to improve their entire writing skill during this nine week course, it was to focus on each student's uh, real weaknesses and ask them to just focus on fixing those things. So uh, one way is just, it, and it didn't take that long actually. I, I, when I started doing it, I thought, oh, this is gonna take forever. But once you have your student's name and you've determined which are the, which the, which are the errors that they most uh, frequently make, uh, then they start looking for them in their own work as, they, as the term progresses. And if I was just keeping a count, literally not the account of how many times they made it that mistake in their work. So some of them, for example, would have some subject verb agreement problem, for example, and I would say, okay, in this first essay, um, you know, you made this mistake, you know, seven times. <laughs> in the second one, you made it five times. And we're hoping to see that kind of progression that it's going down and down and they're being becoming more and more aware of it. Um, so using just an Excel sheet and, and counts, um, although it's heavy for you at first, um, in the end, it's worth it. And you can, when you have a meeting with the student at the end of the term, you can show them their progress, which is really pretty powerful for them because they see that their effort has not been wasted. Um, let's see, what's... Uh, the difference between assessment of and assessment for learning. What do you think? Who, can, who knows that uh, the answer to that question? So if we're just thinking in terms of uh, uh, summative and formative assessment, uh, uh, we might think that assessment of learning is a summative type of assessment and assessment for learning is a formative type of assessment. In other words, uh, we're assessing our students uh, to help them better learn. Yeah, and, and that is an ongoing process that happens throughout the course, throughout the class, throughout the term. Assessment of learning uh, comes after the teaching, after the class, after the course, after the content. And it may be for a, a grade, yeah, for, an, uh, for a mark. 
Yeah, Sandeep, I agree. They need to have an idea of why they need to maintain the journal. So a, a, a log, a learning log, call, calling it something like a learning log, uh, maybe a little bit better than calling it a journal. Yeah. Okay, anything else? All right. What online tools can we use for assessments? Um, you know, I, I wish I could answer that. I don't know any online uh, assessment tools, I'm afraid. That's not my real area of expertise, but um, the best assessments come from your own teaching. What did you teach and allowing your students to express their uh, to express their understanding and demonstrate their understanding in some kind of uh, very personal way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, Liz, I have it. I have got a question. Okay. Um, so um, after your session, I'm now uh, kind of doubting if I uh, call summative and formative assessment in the right way. So after each unit, we uh, take the tests. That is unit, when the unit finishes, we take the test, but the test is not graded. It's just for students to see how they progress, and, you know, throughout. We're this. having a trouble hearing you go now. Uh, can you hear me now? I can't hear you anymore. Does everyone hear? And is it, is it my computer? I can't hear you. Hello. Ah. Sorry, Gulnora, I didn't hear you. Can you say oh. that again? I, it's, I you, think it's better now. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah, good. Um, so my question was like, our, I, uh, I was thinking of formative assessment also as unit tests because uh, after each unit students take tests but they do not count towards the final grade because it's just for them to see how much they progress during that unit. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is great. I mean, it's graded. They see their kind of score out like 50 questions, how many correct uh, answers they got. Um, I kind of graded, but I do not count it towards the final. So um, yeah. I wonder if it's still uh, kind of uh, considered as a formative or summative. If, well, uh, if, mm -hmm. yeah, I, do you use that? In, what do you use that information for? Do you? Um, yeah, for, for them to see, okay. you know, uh, how much they uh, learned from that unit. For them okay. to you know, to, to test themselves. And for me also to see who needs more help in what areas, there like that is grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. So for me hmm. to see that and for them also to see uh, where they need to work yeah. more. And for me, uh, maybe which student to help more and yeah. uh, yeah. to help with what more. Yeah, that's formative. Yeah, that is a formative assessment. If it's not for a, a grade, it's a, a, a quiz or a little test can definitely be a formative type of assessment. Um, but this kind, of, it, this kind of ongoing sort of quick formative assessment, I is uh, in addition to that uh, super useful. So that when you get to the end of the unit, um, it's not already too late, <laughs> if you know. Yeah. What what I mean to yeah. uh, to help them through the process. Yeah, that's formative. If it's not for a grade, if it's for them to know and for you to know uh, and to improve the teaching learning process, that's what formative. That's the definition of formative assessment. But yeah. you know, they Good. get really worried when I bring the uh, test that the score. So they want to see, okay, how much you know I have uh, uh, got. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, this is the, it's throughout the unit and it, it's, it's quiz, it's kind of graded, not, again, I'm saying, I'm, I'm not grading it towards the uh, kind of counting it towards the final exam, but um, it also helps these students to get, you know, uh, more practice of doing quizzes so that in the final exam, mm -hmm. they already know, uh, you know, how to uh, deal, you know, with these kind of uh, questions. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So thank you it's very much, chat. Lee. Mm -hmm. So your, uh, you, yeah, your session was really good. I also kind of, I had some questions in my mind. I learned so many interesting and useful things. And uh, I think many teachers also who always think about the final test, the summative test. Now, uh, from your webinar, we understood that, uh, you know, formative uh, assessment is really important. And uh, actually, we may not pay attention to the, like, the tools that you have um, shown us today, even just a diary, yes, or a journal. It's a kind of a formative assessment which, uh, for them to see how much they progressed. So yeah. um, this is this is what was really useful, and I learned a lot, and I believe the same uh, have our audience. And um, and I see we don't have uh, any other questions. Uh, so uh, not is saying more important than summative for me. Yes. So uh, exactly yes. This is my my. my main takeaway from your uh, webinar is thank you so much as always very informative <laughs> engaging and interesting thank you our uh, dear audience for your very active participation we had really really uh you know high engagement today and uh, thank you we all uh see you on uh, next thursday thank you